Good evening. Just days after a deadly water surge on the Capilano River, new questions tonight about the safety record of the Cleveland Dam. Documents obtained by CBC News reveal similar incidents dating back almost 20 years ago. Calls for an alarm warning system were raised but never installed. Our Tina Lovegreen looks into why. Uh, memory doesn't leave. It's been over 20 years since Wilson Williams was swept away by the water, but it's still fresh in his mind. Thundering sounds coming from above the, the river, and a couple seconds later I look up, it's just a big black um, visual that just was coming at you. He says the dam had malfunctioned and released a torrent of water. I had to run about 30 feet to safety, and the water took my legs out, but I was close enough to shore to pull myself up. And on Thursday, people fishing along the Caplana River were once again sent scrambling to shore. One man didn't make it, and another in his late 20s is still missing after the dam unexpectedly released a large volume of water while undergoing maintenance. There have been other instances too. Back in 2002, the dam gate malfunctioned, stranding four anglers. Luckily, search and rescue were quick to respond. That event and others prompted WorkSafe BC to do an investigation, which CBC News obtained through a Freedom of Information request. It finds several violations demanding a risk assessment, ordering Metro Vancouver to develop written policy and procedures designed to reduce or eliminate risk to workers and the public, which includes but is not limited to spillway gate lockout, access to the river by workers where lockout is not required, man check systems, emergency rescue and evacuation, public warning signage and warning alarms. Metro Vancouver was ordered to make the dam safer by 2003, which it says it did. At the time, the idea of installing an alarm was floated, but it never happened due to concerns the noise of a siren might annoy neighbours. Who cares? You know what? If we had an alarm system, that was, you know, we could, it could have saved two lives. Things have to change and evolve for the health and safety of everybody. And they need an alarm system, whether that's um, to respect the local residents. Maybe there's a lighting system with the light, light bells on the alarm system on the bridges. Metro Vancouver is still investigating what went wrong this time around and whether an alarm will be part of the safety improvements. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, North Vancouver. A terrible tragedy in Coquitlam. A toddler has died after he and his mother were hit by a car late last night. The two-year-old boy was taken to hospital in critical condition but died earlier today. His mother remains in serious condition tonight. Anyone who saw the accident is asked to call Coquitlam RCMP, the non-emergency line. The area was closed to traffic for several hours but reopened this morning. At this early stage in the investigation, it's been determined um, by dash cam video uh, that the investigators gathered. Uh, through the investigation that there is no uh, criminal behavior and or negligence on the caretaker's part. The driver of the vehicle remained at the scene. RCMP say neither speed nor impairment appear to be factors in the collision. Firefighters say one person was taken to hospital this morning in Prince Rupert after being rescued from a burning building. It started around 9 last night, taking crews 12 hours to extinguish the fire. Several apartments, along with a restaurant and a sewing store, were destroyed. Officials say they don't know what caused the fire yet. Prince Rupert Fire Rescue says they helped one person escape when they arrived, and all the other tenants were able to get out. More promises today as we hit the halfway point of the B.C. election campaign. The B.C. NDP unveiling its party platform, promising a $1,000 check for most families in our province. Our Justin McElroy joins us now for a closer look at that. So, Justin, 60 new promises, in fact, made today. What uh, stands out for you? Yeah, a lot stands out in that large campaign document. It's pointing out, Mike, the vast majority of the promises were actually just to continue things that the NDP government ha is already doing or announced in the last three years. But there were 60 promises that were brand new, like you said, and here are a few of them that really stuck out. So the first, you already mentioned that rebate for families up to $1,000 if you're a two 
people in your family head of household one if you live alone it's five hundred dollars and that's capped off for income so if you're in the upper portion of the income bracket you won't be receiving that second promise is for renters both a rebate of four hundred dollars if you remember that promise from three years ago they're bringing it back this time that four hundred dollars though again only those on the lower ends of the income spectrum capped off at eighty thousand dollars as well as a rent freeze for 2021. the third is free transit for anyone 12 and under throughout bc both bc transit and translink the fourth is widening the fraser highway between surrey and abbotsford the ndp believing that's the better way to deal with congestion than highway one and the fifth well, let's talk about the budget here, what it will cost. The NDP estimating about $2 billion extra per year. That would bring this year's deficit from $13 billion to $15 billion. NDP leader John Horgan, though, says it's all about helping British Columbians who need it the most. I've always focused on making sure that those without voice, those without the wherewithal to buy what they need, have a government that's focused on them. The BC Liberals have another approach. The wealthy and the well-connected are what they focus on. That's not for me. That's his argument, at least the BC Liberals over the past three days being able to come out with a number of high profile announcements of their own. Their platform isn't quite out yet, but starting to get a sense of where these policy differences are between the two major parties. All right, so what uh, was the Liberal response to what the NDP was saying today? Well, they had a number of criticisms uh, about this, but their main fixated on the timing of this. You know, you might remember three weeks ago, John Horgan, when he was premier, announced the economic recovery plan for British Columbia, and there was buildings of spending and tax cuts there. Nowhere in there was a promise of a rebate for families. Jazz Johal arguing, why couldn't the government have announced this sooner? This money was agreed upon in March and the provincial government held on to it till today's announcement. That is unconscionable. What kind of person holds on to money that could help British Columbians? That is not fair. That is not right. That is unconscionable. And it's just plain wrong. With the naked Liberals, of course, promising eliminating the PST for one year if they get into office. The NDP promising up to $1,000 for families if they get into office at that time of year when people are throwing around large sums of money to get elected. That election date just two and a half weeks away now. Sure, we'll see more of that going forward. Thanks, Justin. Justin McElroy reporting tonight. And before he unveiled his party's platform today, NDP leader John Horgan sat down with our provincial affairs reporter, Tanya Fletcher. This interview is the first in a series of sit-downs with all of the party leaders this week. Here's a quick preview. I grappled with the, the calling of the election, and I take full responsibility for it. It was my decision and mine alone. But I looked at the past three and a half years. It's been that long since the last election, and people have forgotten that we are a minority government because we've been acting as if we weren't. We've had great collaboration on many, many issues. And we will have that full interview with NDP leader John Horgan coming up later in our newscast. And one day after announcing plans to restart replacement of the Massey Tunnel with a bridge, the B.C. Liberals focused on transportation again today, this time taking aim at ICBC. Leader Andrew Wilkinson says the party is pledging to open up the auto insurance market to private companies. He's also promising lower premiums for young drivers and has plans to give new drivers credit for two years of safe driving or four years if they take lessons. We need to protect young drivers from skyrocketing premiums so they can get on with their lives and get started. With 30% unemployment amongst people under 25, the additional hit of extremely high auto insurance premiums makes their lives very, very difficult. The NDP wasted no time attacking that Liberal promise to add competition to auto insurance in B.C. Former Attorney General and Party candidate David Eby says the plan to run two parallel systems and add re-add legal costs won't save drivers money. The reason why this wasn't pursued by the BC Liberals when they were in power, when Gordon Campbell was in power and wanted to privatize ICBC, is because it won't work, it will only increase costs, and I never imagined I would be here to say that the BC Liberals were trying to light the dumpster fire again, but this time to do it with the money of British Columbians. And Green Party leader Sonia Furstenau announced, if elected, the party would implement free childcare for children under three with working parents. 
and free early education for three and four year olds. She also took aim at the Liberals' promise of private auto insurance. It's an example of the kind of lurching that we've seen in BC where the NDP come into power, they undo all these things that the Liberals do, the Liberals come into power, they undo a whole bunch of things that the NDP does, and the people of BC have to suffer the consequences of bad governance uh, over and over and over again. First to know also proposed a consultation process that would look at reducing the work week and offering flexible work hours. Two more people have died from COVID-19, bringing BC's total to 244. And today's update from Dr. Bonnie Henry brings another increase in numbers this week right across the board. Hospitalizations are up to 71, five more than yesterday. There are still 16 people in intensive care. Active cases also up to nearly 1,400. That's an increase of about 30 since Monday's update. Nearly 3,100 people are now under public health monitoring. 102 new cases are being reported today, but with just over 8,200 tests done yesterday, the positivity rate remains under 2%. Well, the time for turkey thanks and togetherness is right around the corner. Health experts are sharing tips, though, on how to keep it safe this year. And as Zara Premji explains, the hospitality industry is offering its own COVID safe options as well. Thanksgiving used to look like this, but this year it'll probably look a lot more like this. And health experts are dishing out tips. Make our celebration large in thanks, large in gratitude, but small in size. We're used to dozens and dozens of people interacting during Thanksgiving. Um, I don't think that's going to be a good option this year coming around. I think having a small intimate gathering with a small group of friends um, that's already in your bubble is the recommendation right now. And I think you can still have a great time with that. I'm avoiding shared meals and shared utensils. Not using the same serving spoons is obvious. I'm not feeding from the same plate and handing it around across the table. Opt for individual servings instead of a buffet, reducing the, the chances of mixing. Or try holiday hacks like Thanksgiving to go. Some local restaurants are stepping in with COVID safe options. It just really gives people peace of mind that they can just kind of show up to someone's house that's hopefully within their bubbles and everything is going to come pre-prepped, pre-ready to go. And so there's minimal people having to be involved in the actual cooking. Dak says many in the hospitality industry are taking additional safety precautions. Sanitizing at stations, um, we're doing extra cleaning for basically like a full strip down of our kitchen every week, uh, multiple times. Now this is just the start of a busy holiday season. With Halloween and Christmas just around the corner, Thanksgiving could just be the first look at how future holidays can be spent safely. I really believe that Santa Claus will know how to do this and do it safely as well. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. And meteorologist Johanna Wagseff joins us now on another beautiful fall evening. Any of those airy cirrus behind you, Joe? Wispy, wispy. Wispy, sorry. Whispy. Thank you I for know. wanting to know. <laughs> yes, we, we do have some uh, off in the background, but basically a blue sky day. I wish I could do some cloud identification for you, but uh, after that fog rolled off this morning, we were left with uh, basically nothing but blue, and I've got another day like this in the forecast. But before we get to the forecast, just a long range sneak peek at the long weekend that may actually be helping some of that uh, advice I was just talking about. A good day or good weekend, I should say, to hunker down with your small bubble, uh, tracking a storm around the corner. But let me get to the current temperatures right now. Uh, 15 at YVR, a little chilly. We uh, just hit a 16 earlier today. High teens across the island. Uh, looking to see temperatures like that for one more day before we get back down to our seasonal for the weekend. More like mid-teens for this time of the year. Look at that sort of uh, front draped across the province. That that is starting to tap into a bit of an atmospheric river that will straighten out and sink south just in time for our Friday. So taking you through the next 24 hours, a cooler night, back up to similar temperatures tomorrow afternoon. It might take a little longer for the fog to burn off, more like a noon story before we see these blue skies. But tomorrow might be the last day to enjoy the blue skies before uh, I bring you the rain. So I'll talk more about that coming up. Okay, we'll check in with you in a little bit. Thank you, Joe. 
And a reminder, you can always watch this newscast live and other CBC programs on the free CBC GEM app. Yes, and CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. And you can follow both of us and Johanna on Instagram and Twitter as well. He stepped out of the hospital and straight back onto the election campaign. But more and more of his cabinet is getting sick. The latest on the White House outbreak, next. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, wide open spaces have been a big draw for many homeowners even before the pandemic. And the skyrocketing demand for pets has developers taking note. The CBC's Corey Seegers looks at how dog parks are becoming a big consideration in community planning. As our suburbs expand, developers are starting to notice how our families are changing. Dog parks are becoming a big deal. In Edmonton, a fenced off leash park was developed as part of this community's master plan. I do think it's essential. Uh, it should be part of the community. It's really great to see other children here as well, enjoying the dogs and spending time with our, with our community. Gina Jarrett comes here daily with her dog Talia, an eight-month-old St. Berdoodle. Like a lot of people, she got her puppy to help her through the pandemic. I have met so many different people and we've got to laugh and joke about our dogs and, and just say how much we've enjoyed coming here just to socialize and spend time. And as I said, especially in the time of COVID, it just sort of brightens our days. One neighborhood has even taken a poochy approach to their planning and design. They not only built with an off-leash park as part of the plan, they market the neighborhood with a huge emphasis on animal amenities. Over time, development and design of communities is, has changed and is constantly changing. Uh, the park space is, is always a constant, but it's the use of that park space. Uh, who uses it? Brookfield Residential, the group behind that pet inclusive community, is now working on plans for another off-leash area in another one of their developments. There is such a, uh, a demand and, a, and an affection for animals that, you know, we would be, you know, we would really be missing a great opportunity to have something in our communities, in our homes, and and that, that people really want because the pets are part of the family. Both developers and urban planners say dog parks are coming up at the top of the list in what people are looking for. And as the number of pandemic puppy adoptions continues to rise, so will the space they need in our communities. Corey Seegers, CBC News, Edmonton. Well, the practice of burning off stubble and residues from rice and wheat fields take pla takes place after harvest every year in India. But this year's pandemic has made officials sensitive about air quality in what are some of the most already polluted cities in the world. The burning season in India's breadbasket state of Punjab started a little early. The choking air drifts 500 kilometers southeast to the New Delhi region. Air pollution in the area typically worsens from October to December. The pandemic has eased toxicity in urban centers because of reduced activity. So now government officials are looking for safer ways to remove crop waste. Last year, Delhi endured nine consecutive days of hazardous air quality in late October and early November. Yeah, last thing they need is more pollution, bad air quality over there, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, stick around. We will be back with more COVID-19 news from across the country and, of course, from around the world. Stay with us. U.S. President Donald Trump spent a full day in the White House, still sick, but far from silent. The truth about his condition isn't any clearer tonight. But as Susan Ormiston shows us, his goals are crystal clear. Downplay COVID-19 and show that he is still in charge. Isolating, even in this home, was never going to work well with this president. Trump unleashing a torrent of tweets on an old theme, suggesting that the flu kills more and COVID's less deadly. Neither is true. Twitter issued a warning and Facebook pulled it. Last night at the golden hour, Trump's made-for-TV return from hospital included a made-for-TV video, which in these grainy images, it appears he recorded with multiple takes standing on the Truman balcony. Don't let it dominate you. 
Don't be afraid of it. You're going to beat it. We have the that place. enraged the widow of a Canadian actor who died of COVID. So we, we saw what this disease can do. So guess what? We are afraid. Trump's doctor reported again today the president is doing extremely well. But the White House grounds almost deserted as many staff and media stayed home. The press briefing room sprayed down. Four staff have been infected, three journalists. To rely solely on rapid tests as the White House does is a mistake, says this doctor. Too often people take a negative test as they don't have COVID, they do not need masking, and they do not have to change their behavior. That is not how these tests should be used. Also today, concerns about a gold star reception a week ago. Almost all the Joint Chiefs of Staff, including top General Mark Milley, now in quarantine after a Coast Guard admiral tested positive. And for the first day in five, no sighting yet of the patient still here. CBC Susan Ormiston reporting tonight from Washington, D.C. And COVID-19 is likely to be an important topic in tomorrow's U.S. vice presidential debate. And CBC News will have live coverage for you with analysis before and after providing a Canadian perspective. Join us for our special live coverage starting at 4 p.m. Pacific time on CBC News Network or streaming on CBC Gem, the CBC News app or cbcnews.ca. The debate itself between Mike Pence and Kamala Harris kicks off at 6 o'clock. And Canada has signed a deal with a U.S. company to buy up to 20.5 million antigen tests. It's the first COVID-19 rapid test of its kind to receive the green light from Health Canada. These point-of-care tests are crucial to expanding testing capacity more generally because these samples can be analyzed on site and do not require transportation to a lab to produce results. The test, produced by Abbott Laboratories, can yield results in less than 20 minutes. It uses a sample collected from a nasal or throat swab. Antigen tests look for viral proteins. This method is considered convenient and fast, but not highly accurate. Standard tests are processed in labs and can detect positive cases nearly 100% of the time. Ontario's Premier and many health experts have been calling for more testing options to ease the growing demand. Many regions have been struggling with long lines and backlogs at testing centres amid the spike in COVID-19 cases. The government says 8.5 million of these antigen tests will be distributed across the country by the end of the year. And new data from Toronto tonight shows some city neighbourhoods are still being affected by COVID-19 more than others. The information obtained by the Toronto Star reveals some areas have test positivity rates above 10%. Lorenda Redekop has more on the people affected. In the last week, personally, I've seen many very sick COVID patients. Um, a few of them had to go to critical care. This Toronto doctor also works with the group Masks for Canada. He first sounded the alarm yesterday on social media with information leaked to his group. It confirmed what we were thinking, that, that the amount of COVID in the community is getting out of control. These are people who work hard and then they're exposed at essential businesses. Um, that often don't require PPE or masks, and then they bring it home to crowded apartment buildings uh, where they'll infect extended families. Today, more stats came out. According to data obtained by the Toronto Star, not verified by CBC, four neighbourhoods have test positivity rates over 10%. Three are in the northwest, Finch and Weston, Jane and Shepherd, and Keel and Lawrence. The other is northeast of Young and Eglinton. When uh, there's a, quote, a positivity rate in terms of the test done over 10%, that's very worrisome because that, that indicates there's probably a high degree of community transmission and lots of, quote, unlinked cases. Folks are uh, right to be alarmed and concerned and frankly afraid, uh, you know, when they read numbers like that. They're neighborhoods where people often take crowded buses, live in close quarters. He wants more support from the government. They need to tell folks what, what the plan is for uh, the communities that are being most impacted. Today, the government responded, though wouldn't confirm those numbers. We have to focus on, we, we go out there, we put the mobile testing units up, uh, we get more advertising within those communities. Toronto Public Health recently put a hold on most contact tracing, apart from congregate settings, saying it can't keep up. Ontario health officials wonder if it should be added in those communities. We have to determine 
where these people are, are uh, getting their infections. And also in terms of offering um, voluntary isolation facilities for cases if they feel that they are in a household where they cannot uh, properly self-isolate. This doctor wants tougher rules for workplaces. Eliminate the break room. A lot of outbreaks are happening in the lunchroom or the break room where people take off their masks. Have people eat outside if that's possible or in their cars if that's possible. As many health workers are calling for, he also wants bars and restaurants closed in hard-hit communities. Lorenda Radikop, CBC News, Toronto. In Quebec today, more than 1,300 new cases were diagnosed. And while the pandemic has been hard on everyone, for school children, particularly teens, it's been especially hard. Jay Turnbull takes a look at how changes at school are affecting the mental health of students in Quebec. Yeah. COVID-19 is robbing these high school hockey players of what is supposed to be their big year. Next year, high school will be a memory. This is the last year where we can kind of be our, our group and have that chemistry that we've built up over the five years. Besides missing out on their favorite sport, the pandemic is affecting their mental health. I feel like I'm less and less productive because of all this being shut down. I feel like it's I'm, I don't have the motivation. Hockey was the motivation for me to kind of keep my grades up in school and work hard and stuff like that. So I feel like sometimes I'm at a loss. Socializing is an important part of high school and it hasn't been easy. We only get to see each other at lunch or after school. And usually we see each other like between periods and now we don't even see each other between because we have to stay in our class so i feel like we're in a prison but not everyone is struggling academically because of covid it's actually been really easy dylan molinero chose this school because he loves hockey and he says the sport has helped him work harder at his studies he's not looking forward to spending every other day in zoom classes but he's adapting to his bubble class I'm kind of getting to know some new people, getting friends with some other people, and uh, it's pretty good. When I come home, I just do homework because there's nothing else that I could really do. But these boys can count themselves luckier than others. They're in Sparitud, which for now has not been cancelled. Other sports have been suspended until at least the end of the month. This expert says these measures could have a lasting impact. Long term, these children may suffer from loneliness and suffer from being um, feeling really apart from other groups. And I really worry about their self-esteem, their sense of identity as they grow up. The Quebec government has noticed it's hiring 250 more counselors to go into schools. Jay Turnbull, CBC News, St. Hubert. Nearly a week after a federal commercial rent assistance program expired, Ottawa hasn't yet announced a new plan to help businesses. But as David Cochran heard, something new and improved can't come soon enough. So we were open uh, two and a half years, just over two years, uh, and then the pandemic hit. Anthony Bailey's taco place was taking off when COVID shut everything down. We was either walk away or uh, merge the businesses. So he closed this location and moved around the corner, sacrificing the coffee shop he ran in that space to cut costs and save the taco business. It's very stressful. We had five, six years of hard work destroyed in five months, six months. Sales are down 90 percent. Employees cut from 15 to just two. Government-backed credit lines, the wage subsidy and federal rent assistance have kept them going, but the rent program is over and Bailey's rent is past due. I haven't paid. Ironically, I was just speaking with my landlord this morning and the expectation is full rent for October. Deputy Prime Minister Christa Freeland has tweeted help is coming and that she is firmly committed to supporting small businesses with their fixed costs, such as rent. But there's no firm timeline and officials are still trying to fix the problems that undermined the first rental program. The uptake was too low because only landlords could apply and they had to agree to take a loss. This time, sources say that tenants like Bailey will likely be able to apply directly for help, which is crucial. Ottawa is a COVID hotspot. More slowdowns, if not full shutdowns, seem likely. If we don't get help, our businesses will fail. So it's, uh, it's very scary. In a statement, Freeland says she is still finalizing a plan working with businesses and other levels of government. Her office won't release any further details, but says she will have something more to announce soon, even though rent is already past due.
David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal government has secured millions of doses of potential COVID-19 vaccines, but some officials in other countries are accusing Canada and other wealthy nations of hoarding. As Christine Birak reports, they say that's not the way to beat a global pandemic. If any of the nine leading COVID-19 vaccines prove effective, the world is in for a new, likely chaotic race. I am proudly putting America first, just as you should be putting your countries first. Vaccine nationalism is every country for itself. Wealthier nations buying up vaccine supplies, leaving little behind for the rest of the world. This agreement secures up to 20 million doses for Canadians. Scientists warn it's a dangerous path. Models predict that if rich countries monopolize COVID-19 vaccines instead of distributing them equally, it could cause twice as many deaths. What that really means is that people will unnecessarily die. Former White House health policy advisor Dr. Zeke Emanuel says sadly the U.S. is going it alone and buying up vaccine doses. But in some ways, so is Canada. Canada's pre-bought um, what is it, about uh, six or seven times its population. Uh, so we need to think through that. Is that, you know, a kind of hoarding? Experts say it's also driving up vaccine prices. Personally, I think it's important for Canada to be responsible for its people. Virologist Alison Kelvin is evaluating made in Canada vaccines at a prominent lab in Saskatoon. She wants Canadians vaccinated as quickly as possible, but... The pandemic isn't going to end if we just put Canada first. The World Health Organization wants to allow all nations to quickly vaccinate certain groups that are at high risk of spreading the virus. About 90% of the world's countries have bought into the WHO's COVAX program, including Canada. With COVID-19, no one is safe until everyone is safe. But the program isn't fully funded yet, and not everyone's on board. China is still in negotiations, and experts say the U.S. would only join under new leadership. You could take the view that your population might like you better if you were the one um, grabbing all the vaccine, but your population won't love you if the pandemic's going on and on and on. Equitable distribution won't be easy, but global health experts insist vaccine nationalism is self-defeating, driving up prices, costing lives, and ultimately prolonging this pandemic. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. He launched his party's platform today with some big promises. Coming up, we chat one-on-one -on -one with NDP leader John Horgan. Well, that's the government side of the picture. All the opposition parties can and do pick holes in it. 4,000 miles of new highways, everyone likes that. But the opposition politicians ask if social values can be measured in hundreds of miles of blacktop. They point out that British Columbians pay the highest taxes in Canada, $78 per year per capita. The bridges are fine, and when you come right down to logic, everyone agrees that tolls are the best way to pay for them but the financial structure behind those tolls is under heavy fire. The car ferries are clean and efficient, but again, the opposition say that they cost $13 million against an estimate of three millions. And let's go back to that tourist picture of a booming, prosperous province. It's true in one sense. The mills are working, but lumber sales have been falling in this province where lumber is life. Average wages are the highest in the nation, but so is unemployment. It was especially grave last winter when these men paraded in protest. And now, if you talk to some of the jobless, you'll learn they've been without work ever since. Depending on whose figures you take, anything from 70 to 100,000 British Columbians are out of work. More than 11% of the labor force were actively seeking work this summer at the peak of the employment season. Everyone agrees that it's a major issue, and the Liberal Party has taken it as a main issue. They've got a new leader one who's trying for a legislature seat for the first time. He's young, enthusiastic, and he's been barnstorming the province to hammer out a 24-point liberal plan to deal with jobs. Here's how Ray Perot spoke about unemployment and a meeting in the lovely lake country around Salmon Arm. 
of all of the nations of the industrialized West, Canada today has the highest rate of unemployment. Of all of the areas in, in Canada, our province of British Columbia has the highest rate. I heard a statistic the other day which suggested that we have in BC at the present time from 60 to 100,000 unemployed, depending on whose statistics are accepted. I believe it must be the first duty of government to make sure that our people have maximum employment opportunities. Because unless we have people who are drawing wages, people who are enjoying incomes, we're not going to have very many happy homes. And we're not going to have happy children. We're not going to have healthy people. So unemployment in the Liberal Party view is the number one issue facing our province today. Of course, it's not only the Liberals who are concerned. The CCF is calling for a massive assault on unemployment. The Communists, in an approach which to most people seems a little remote from provincial jurisdiction, are asking for a federal switch from national defense to a crash program to create jobs. The Conservatives want a vastly expanded winter works program, with the province taking the initiative and paying a share of the extra cost. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The best thing I could say is that hopefully we learn from it and they put in some new alarm systems and just to ensure that doesn't happen again. Just days after a deadly water surge on the Capilano River, new questions tonight about the safety record of the Cleveland Dam. Documents obtained by CBC News reveal similar incidents dating back almost 20 years. And calls for an alarm warning system were raised back then, but it never happened, partly because of concerns about the noise. Today we're announcing that a BC Liberal government will remove the monopoly for ICBC. Our plan provides a one-time $1,000 recovery benefit to help families. As we hit the halfway mark of the campaign trail, party leaders are promising voters affordability to win votes. The Liberals are pledging to open up BC's auto insurance to private companies to drive down rates. And the NDP unveiled its platform, promising rebate checks, rent freeze until 2021, and expanded $10 a day daycare. Green Party Sonia Firstenau says they want to see free childcare and four-day work weeks. And CBC News will have extended interviews with all of the party leaders this week as we are at the halfway point of this election campaign. And tonight, our provincial affairs reporter, Tanya Fletcher, sits down with NDP leader John Horgan for this one-on-one -on -one interview. Talking about homelessness, if your party thinks Andrew Wilkinson's solution is um, perhaps de dehumanizing or unrealistic, what is your alternative? I know you've asked people for patience on this front for a long time, but with winter coming up, uh, that is a very um, tangible concern. What is your immediate plan to help deal with those encampments? Well, certainly uh, with, with shelter beds being closed because of the pandemic and the need for physical distancing, that's created tremendous strains on social agencies that provide services to people, vulnerable populations. And we've been working as hard as we can with municipalities to get new housing built. Modular housing has been extremely successful with wraparound services, social workers, uh, helping people get into treatment processes. All of that will take time and we need to redouble those efforts as the winter comes upon us. But we need to do it in a collaborative way, cooperating with municipalities and the service providers that are so desperately important to this process. Looking at the, the uh, simultaneous public health emergencies, 4,000 people have died of a drug overdose on your watch. 230 have also died from COVID, yet the drug overdose crisis has been a public health emergency for years. So why has your government not acted with the same urgency as it has with the pandemic, especially when the provincial health officer has outlined specific things that can be done at a provincial level? Well, I would say we have done a great deal on the opioid crisis. We were the first province in the country to have a standalone minister for mental health and addiction. So we had someone getting up every day focused only on the opioid crisis and the need for mental health services. And we were making progress until the pandemic hit and a couple of variables came into play. 
I talked about the shelter beds. Uh, we've seen our borders closed, which means that the fentanyl, the, the dirty drug supply, is getting dirtier. So that's why I reached out to Prime Minister Trudeau and said we need to take the criminalized element out of here. We need to focus like a laser on the pushers and the people that are taking advantage of vulnerable people, and that means law enforcement. But we need help with treatment, and we need help with with safe supply or prescription alternatives. That's Dr. Henry's solution and we're working on that. Not as fast as she would like, not as fast as I would like, but we need collaboration again, support from the federal government. There's a lot of good talk going on, but people are in crisis and we need to be there, not just us, but the city and the feds as well. I want to ask you about uh, Indigenous relations. I remember talking to you, I think it was in February, and um, you mentioned that the the Wet'suwet'en conflict uh, to date had been your most uh, difficult challenge since you've taken office. You've said that UNDRIP and reconciliation is a priority, yet we've heard almost nothing about that so far in this campaign. Is this not a priority for you now? Oh, it absolutely is, and, and, and it's not the waving of a wand. You don't eliminate uh, almost 200 years of colonialism over a, over a winter. Uh, we've made great progress in terms of uh, reconciliation uh, agreements uh, with First Nations. The treaty process is revitalized again, which is a parallel process to reconciliation. UNDRIP is uh, work plans being developed. That was part of the legislation. Uh, the Wet'suwet'en issues were challenging because the courts had determined back in the 1990s that rights and title existed and the hereditary system in Wet'suwet'en territory should be legitimized. And we're almost 30 years since that court decision and that's why there was so much frustration in Wet'suwet'en territory, rightly so. Let's get back to the uh, number one issue, why we're having an election in the first place. I think a lot of voters are confused about that, at least from the public uh, reasoning on that front. Mm -hmm. You said it's because of problems with the Greens that go all the way back to the summer. So why didn't you highlight those cracks earlier? Because when people heard that when the election was called, they kind of felt blindsided, like if this was really an issue months in the, in the running, then why are we just hearing about this now? Well, there were, I grappled with the, the calling of the election, and I take full responsibility for it. It was my decision and mine alone. But I looked at the past three and a half years, it's been that long since the last election, and people have forgotten that we are a minority government because we've been acting as if we weren't. We've had great collaboration on many, many issues. Yet there was speculation for months before the election was actually called. So is that not just retroactive spin to kind of blame it on the Greens in hindsight? No, I, I, I highlighted some of the differences the Greens and I have had in recent months, uh, but we did do a great deal together. I, I don't want to dismiss that. But the challenges of not being able to move quickly when situations present themselves in the midst of a pandemic, I think is pretty profound. And you can watch the full interview with NDP leader John Horgan on our YouTube and Facebook pages. And you can tune in tomorrow when Tanya sits down with a one-on-one -on -one with BC Green leader Sonia Furstenau. Saying goodbye to a legend. Coming up, we remember a guitar giant, Eddie Van Halen. The rock and roll pioneer has died at the age of 65. And at 6.42 p.m., there's a live look out towards the North Shore on a misty night, but it's still quite pretty out there. Very romantic looking. Mix of fog and sun earlier today, and change is coming, though. We are looking at possibly a storm this weekend. Johanna will time that out for us next. People worry that bread is bad for you. You know, to that I say, bad bread is bad for you and good bread is good for you. I'm Marc-André Royal, the owner of the bakery La Bête à Pain here in Montreal. I got into bread uh, basically when I was younger. I was working in restaurants in London, England, uh, New York, and all the bread was made in-house. I was always really obsessed with it. You know, it smells like butter, it smells like fresh bread maybe your mom was making when you were a young kid. And the crusts are very important, you know, you get some nice cracking noise on it. So it doesn't look like it was made from a machine. It looks like it was made by someone today, super fresh and with love. You can't cheat with bread. It's kind of a very simple thing, but hard to master. There's few ingredients, right? So it's almost like religious. It's really, when you talk to bakers, they're very obsessed with the starter, the wheat, uh, the technique and all that. So it's about searching that perfect bread and just do, doing it day after day. 
breads are very healthy because of the fermentation process. Basically what happens, the acid lactics will transform some of the chemicals and you'll be able to absorb the minerals easier in your body. Where it's not fermented, all the minerals just get flushed out. So that's why the fermentation process is really key to better nutrition. So get to, to know a good bakery and ask for how it's made. So there you go. We'll leave it for about 45 minutes maybe. The bread will decide when it's ready. Most sold bread in the world probably, baguettes. 18 hour fermentation. What you're looking for is a well cooked baguette, nice and crispy on the outside and a really nice inside, nice bubbles in there. Best bread ever. Very popular these days all across, I'm pretty sure Canada, multi-grain bread. Because of the omega-3s, you know, all the grains, all the, uh, the seeds in there, excellent with toast too, because the seeds get toasted. It's like really, really amazing for sandwiches and stuff like that. Any viennoiserie, any breads that's left over, we just uh, dice it up. Add a little cream, little eggs, little milk, nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger, and we just make bread pudding. And uh, we serve this for breakfast here at the bakery. There's croutons you can make, very simple, but so good. Viennoiserie is French for pastry. The fresh croissant in the morning, that's what makes a bakery. What you're looking for is a nice golden color, and you want to see the layers. That's the layers of butter and dough and that will make it crispy and flaky, and that's what's good about them. Take a habit of going to your bakery, you know, twice a week, once a week, and buy fresh stuff, eat them, and then go back again, you know? When they're just on point, just freshly made, it's a world of difference. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Three physicists have been awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize for Physics for their discoveries on black holes, and their reactions were very down to earth. Roger Penrose's discovery in the dark corners of the universe dates back to 1964. He will get half of the nearly one and a half million dollar Canadian prize for his work proving black holes are a direct consequence of the general theory of relativity. Gez and Genzel share the other half for discovering a colossal invisible black hole at the center of the Milky Way, governing the orbit of stars. Nobel Committee members used props and slides today to try to illustrate the subject. I would need a lot of props and slides to try to understand. <laughs> yeah, I must admit, I'm not sure I understood half the things I just read yeah. just now. <laughs> you fooled holes, me, you fooled me. <laughs> with the black holes, the, the, the grooves uh, in between songs on record albums. Hey. Anybody remembers what a record <laughs> or album Or CDs, was? maybe? Somebody who does understand all this stuff Discs is Johanna Wagstaff. That's right, Joe can help us decode. All yeah. you need to know, guys, is black holes are so hot right now. If that oh, okay. wasn't, yeah, <laughs> if that wasn't apparent with the uh, Nobel Prizes, but it's true, they're helping us understand uh, dark matter. So uh, I want to stay tuned. And uh, I've got a forecast that I know everyone's staying tuned to because the long weekend is uh, coming and I know everyone's seen the rain that is also in the forecast. So you get out inside and enjoy the last of the sunshine tomorrow afternoon. Let me take you to the temperatures across the country. We've got that nice little warm pocket just hanging on to southern uh, BC, 16 right now in Toronto and single digits in Atlantic Canada. Uh, watch the temperatures in the interior, still above seasonal by a good five degrees, starting to cool down a little as we head into Thursday. We're starting to lose what's left of our high pressure as that front draped across the province works its way down. So watch this as I take you through Wednesday. What's not showing up in the models is the morning fog. So definitely look for that tomorrow morning. And that lower stratus might hang on until about noon or one before we clear out. So very different start to the day. Uh, we'll get the sunshine as we head into the afternoon. 
Thursday, I've got to put the risk of showers in. Uh, mainly cloudy, and I think it's more drizzle. The main event, this atmospheric river, will arrive for Thursday night into Friday. Remember uh, two weekends ago, that washout that we had? That is what's in store for this weekend. This big Aleutian low is moving in, opening the door to an atmospheric river, tapping into a, a Pacific temperature, moisture, and wind. So by Saturday, right into that storm, and we'll see that uh, basically fire hose pointed at us through to the holiday Monday. So let's break it down. You can see we're sort of dealing with uh, deteriorating conditions each day, depending on how you look at it. Uh, we are getting to that time of year, though, that we could start to use the rain. 18 tomorrow. If we're lucky, I might be, a, a, if we get that sun early enough, I think we'll hit 18. And still mild on Thursday. Uh, I've got the risk of showers in, drizzle in the morning, and ramping up to rain through the evening hours. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, this is pretty heavy-duty rain. I'll be looking at some of the rainfall totals. Uh, tomorrow and we'll find some breaks in there as well uh, it won't be constant I'll see if we can look for an afternoon where you can head outside a uh, temperature is also back down to seasonal these are actually our seasonal numbers it's been a very very mild October we'll be adding up those numbers as we head to the end of the month but yes fall arriving just in time for everyone to hunker down with the turkey sounds like pumpkin spice lattes and staying home mm. all weekend thank you so much you called Joe. it <laughs>a state funeral today for John Turner, Canada's 17th prime minister. Justin Trudeau called him a great Canadian and he talked about an early connection to Turner. As John used to tell it, he got a last minute call from my father one Christmas Eve. Dad told him that mom, who was very pregnant with me, would like to go to midnight mass with John and Jill. John was caught off guard, but he managed to call Father O'Rourke at Mount Carmel Church to make arrangements. They made mass, went back to the Turner's house for a nightcap, and eventually went home, where my mother promptly went into labor. I was born the next morning. Family and dignitaries sat socially distanced at St. Michael's Cathedral in Toronto. Turner was remembered as, quote, a wonderful friend and a man of integrity, civility, and practicality. He led Canada for just 79 days back in 1984, but he was a longtime government minister. John Turner was 91 when he died last month. And legendary musician Eddie Van Halen has died. A co-founder of the band Van Halen, he was considered one of the best guitarists in rock history. <laughs> His blinding speed, control, and innovation won legions of fans and critical praise. His talent also helped propel the band to the top of the music world in the 1980s with chart toppers such as Jump in Panama. He also played a solo on Michael Jackson's hit song, Beat It. Van Halen is among the top 20 best-selling artists of all time. The band was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. Eddie Van Halen died after a long battle with cancer. He was 65 years old. Well, a trash can that's a little out of this world and also a vintage treasure. Meet the Orbit next. Rondem Martins of Lower Sackville imports these Spanish pedencos and finds them homes here in the Maritimes. She says they're used for hunting back in Spain and then usually abandoned. Last Monday, she flew from Spain to Toronto with four of them. But when the British Airways flight landed at Pearson, Crystal, the white pedenco, jumped out of the cargo hold and ran. What happened next was an hours-long high-tech search quarterbacked by officials high up in the control tower. They did a phenomenal job. This was not their fault. And they just, they spent 13 hours looking for her. While crews on the ground drove for hours in the dark looking, air traffic control diverted flights away from the search area. Finally, an infrared camera locked in. Once our security operations had a thermal image of her, uh, they were able to direct myself and our wildlife team to the general area. And at that time, she was in a bit of a gully at the end of one of the runways in tall grass. Finding her was one thing, but catching up to her 
next to impossible. Crystal, just with her breed, she is a very fast dog. So there were times where it just looks like a white blur running down uh, the taxiway. While the other three dogs got settled in the airport hotel, they had no idea what was going on with Crystal. If something good could come from COVID, we're very blessed that there weren't very many planes flying um, because people aren't traveling. So that was another added bonus. Eventually, after running for hours, Crystal was wiped out. By daylight Tuesday morning, she just crawled under a nearby truck and laid down. Airport staff crawled under with her and gained her trust. You never start a shift thinking you're going to be chasing a dog down a runway. Um, but overall, I'm glad it ended the way it did. Uh, it's There's nothing like being able to reunite uh, an animal with its owner. These dogs are pretty important to us, and uh, I'm just glad she's okay. The search party celebrated on the runway Tuesday morning and took a few photos. Today, Crystal is relaxing at her new home in Moncton. Preston Mulligan, CBC News, Halifax. On your street, ooh, ooh, ooh. on your street, ooh, ooh, ooh. on your street, ooh, ooh, ooh. on your street. Hi, I am Noah Bowers reporting in Grand Falls, Windsor. I am about to ha harvest some carrots that I grew this summer from, with the help from my brother and sister. This is Noah Bowers in Grand Falls, Windsor. Back to you, CBC. On your street. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Stream your favorite CBC dramas or comedies 24-7 on demand on the CBC Gem app. Plus, you can live stream CBC Vancouver News. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver inbox and keep connected with us. Well, you know the saying, one person's trash is another person's treasure. Yes, well, nothing could be truer in the case of our next story, where a trash can was actually the dream <laughs> gift. But it's not any ordinary trash can. It's one of a can, and it's, well, out of this world. Take a look. This is an orbit. And for the older generations, we remember what it was. It's actually a big trash can so that people didn't litter along the highway. Along the Trans-Canada to Portage of Prairie, there was this orbit. And there's a countdown. There's a sign that said, countdown to orbit, 10. And then another second there, 9. And you'd try to count to see if you'd get at each one and you'd time it right. And then say, put your trash into orbit so that people didn't litter along the, the highways. But for a kid, you thought, it's space. And your trash is going to go actual into orbit. How crushing it was when it didn't. But that's what these were until they were decommissioned. This year for Father's Day, my wonderful wife Amanda got me the last remaining orbit that we we're aware of. I came out one morning, and there was a construction crew all around here. I'm like, oh, do you need me to move it? Uh, where do you need it out of the way? And uh, the foreman goes, no, 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 I'm just telling the young folk what this is and what it was. It's going to be a planter. So all the dog walkers, don't get any ideas. <laughs> uh, there's a number of flowers, wave petunias, the galaxy, there's cosmos. We're going to make it look like a, a comet. Uh, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. You don't see Bruce often spelled with two O's, but nope. he is the orbit guy, I guess. So it, maybe it makes sense. I the, don't know. the circles make sense. Yeah. In These the things, uh, I think this would be a good good idea now, right? Why uh, not? Well, as long as you had like you know trash, recycling, you'd have to do a lot of separating and stuff like that. Can't just throw it all in one, right? It does kind of take up a lot of space, though. 
Oh. Making a comeback, Leanne. I feel, I feel it. I think we can, <laughs> I think we can push it. Maybe, maybe not. That's yeah, all I got. That, that's all you got. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> it's cool. Just a reminder, you can always watch this newscast online, cbc.ca slash bc. And our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock with Dan Burt right after the National. Have a good night. Good night.